We on? All right. Well, we're live. It's that time. Hope everybody's having a good week. Welcome to our midweek Bible study here at Macedonia Baptist Church. So good to see everybody here. Welcome to folks that are joining us online. We thank you for being with us here as well. Hope everyone had a good Easter weekend. I know we had a good Easter celebration here at our church Sunday. It was a moving service, and we had some folks that worked very hard to put that on. A lot of them here with us tonight. We appreciate everything that you've done. If you're watching us online, you haven't had an opportunity to view it, I go, go and uh, pull it up. It is a good service, and so uh, you can watch that anytime. Um, Trying to think. Is there anything I need? Oh, let's go, let's talk about announcements. There we go. A couple of things to pass along announcement-wise. One, Saturday, men, is men's breakfast. This coming Saturday, we'll go eat at the uh, Food City on the north end of town there, Old Coy Crossing. Uh, we'll meet there at 8 o'clock Saturday morning. Uh, tell your friends, bring them on. It's always a good time of fellowship. Uh, also, Tuesday night is a Lord's Stitcher night. Uh, and this next coming Tuesday night, so six o'clock. Hope to see you there for that. That is a wonderful ministry. You can come out for that on the ninth. Mark your calendar. Also, mark your calendar for June the twenty fourth <clears throat> through the twenty eighth. That is our um, vacation Bible school week, six to eight thirty those days, six in the evening till eight thirty at night. I'm well, not six in the morning, okay? Uh, but that'll be a good time. Be in prayer for that. Be in prayer about how the Lord might use to help with that and so if you have any questions uh tim abbott is our sunday school director this year get with brother tim and he can fill you in, fill you in and find you a place to serve um annie armstrong we collect a, an offering for missions in the north america and it's called the annie armstrong easter offering named after a lady named annie armstrong who was instrumental many years ago in helping to raise funds for missionaries and, and people overseas and Annie's, our goal to to raise for Annie was to raise three thousand dollars, and to date we have raised thirty three hundred and seventy five dollars. So I want to thank you for your generosity and helping us to meet that goal. And I will remind you that every single penny of that goes to the field. We're not keeping a dime of that here. Uh, it all goes to pay what is needed so the gospel can get out. And by that I mean not administrative salaries or things like that. This buys gas for uh, vans and buses that missionaries use to pick up kids. This pays light bills, uh, churches planted, or ministry places that have to go. This, uh, Many things like that. Every bit of this goes to the field uh, to help support those missions. And thank you so much for helping us with that. Okay. I think that's all I've got. Announcement wise right now. It's hard to believe, but it's April already. My goodness, isn't it? Here we are. It is April already, and we are moving right along. We're going to look at our prayer list here. As you look at our prayer list, and I will want to remind folks, if you have a prayer concern, and we'll update our prayer list at the end of our time tonight. <clears throat> if you're watching us online and you have a prayer concern that you would like to pass along to the body, just message us through whatever media outlet you're watching us on tonight or go to macedoniabaptist.church. That's our church website and you can message us through that as well. If you fill out the information tab on there, we'll send the prayer sheet and the announcement sheet to you as well if you haven't done that already. All right. <clears throat> uh, we always pray for our deacons and their ministry that they do here. We're praying for our nation, <clears throat> our leaders, and uh, we know we need much help there. Remember now, folks, we are in election season, okay? It's going to get ugly before we know it, right? There's going to be name calling and finger pointing and, hey, let's don't be part of the division. You know, let's let's be part of the let's be part of the unification. Let's put it that way. And so anyway, be in prayer for our nation. And before we get too contentious, be in prayer for our community and, and, and the Polk County Women's Jail Ministry. Naja James is dealing with some thyroid issues. Pray for her. Uh, Heather is dealing with lung cancer. Dwight Millsaps is having prostate, uh, sur prostate surgery coming up. Kelly Lawson had surgery Monday for a mass on her kidney. Uh, Wayne Kelly is dealing with liver cancer and has an appointment actually today at Vanderbilt. <coughs> Tim Woody is having to have a pacemaker installed. Uh, Pete James, we've been praying for Pete 
Pete's having some health issues and the AFib and his heart's been uh, bothering him. And so we want to pray for Pete. We continue to lift him up. Tiffany Dobson <clears throat> has been having seizures. Arnold Humbert is dealing with Parkinson's disease. Uh, Robin L. Johnson is in declining health, diagnosed with... <sighs> if you can see that long word right there, okay? Uh, spondylothesis, spondylothesis. There we go. I don't know. That might be right. I, don't, I can't say it. It's a back problem. It's a degenerative spinal <laughs> issue, and it's very... Uh, causing her a lot of pain and discomfort. Pray, pray for Robin L. Charles Dunson and their neighbor, and his neighbor, having some issues. We want to pray for them. Vicki Greer, also having troubles with her neighbor. We want to pray for that situation. Mr. Duncan is in kidney failure. And at, with hospice care, Donna Whitehood, uh, Whitehead, also in renal failure with hospice care. Tom Halfley. Tom had an implantable defibrillator put in. He's had to be back in the hospital and then come back out. Continue to pray for Tom while his body tries to adjust to this deal that's going on here. And his wife, Sally, is dealing with dementia and she has some upcoming tests. Pray for them as well. Christine Borman wants us to continue to pray for her daughter's marriage and financial concerns. Chris Smith had a broken hip, is not recovering well, hasn't been eating uh, and losing weight, and we just want to continue to pray for Chris Smith. Sharon Conway needs a liver transplant. The Carlick family, we continue to pray for them as they've been walking through some very difficult times as a family, uh, just uh, issues that keep them tearing them apart, and we want to see them brought together. Jonathan Bracken, we continue to pray for Jonathan. Uh, and Kendra Allen, we're praying for her as she's in rehab. Marie Williams is in long-term hospice care. We continue to pray for Marie and the family as they minister to her. We've got quite a few that you can see on our list that have cancer or health concerns, spiritual needs. Uh, continue to keep these folks lifted up in your prayer. Each one the Lord loves, the Lord cares for. We commit each one to a good God. And so we'll pray for them here in just a second. Like I said, if you have a prayer concern, you have someone you'd like this body to pray for, you can call our church office or message us. We will pass that along to the body and so that we can keep them on our hearts. Let's uh, open with a word of prayer. And then we're going to turn to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel 7 and talk about fighting. That's what everybody likes to talk about, right? Stand up and fight. Put up your dukes, right? Stay in the fight. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come before you tonight. We are blessed to gather here in peace and safety, O oh God. Thank you, Father, for keeping us last night as these storms move through. And Father, I just pray for any who are affected by some of the tornadoes off from us. But Lord, uh, just to help folks to be healed, Father, to uh, be provided for. And Lord, just uh, that they'll see your hand at work in all things. Father, for these people on our prayer list, we've lifted up. Father, each and every one has a need that you can meet. And so, Father, we commit each and every one to you. Lord, I pray for those, Father, who are listed and those who are not. Father, I pray for the unspoken, and I pray for the heavy hearts that may be watching here with us here tonight. Father, you are the great physician and the great counselor. I pray, oh God, that you would be seen breaking through in each situation. Bring joy, bring recovery, uh, bring health where it needs to be. Lord, lead us as we open your word, and we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. 1 Samuel, chapter 7. We did the first six verses last time we were together. So we're going to start in verse 7 and go down through verse 11 here tonight. And just as a, as a way of background, the Ark of the Covenant has been returned to Israel. Okay. The people were overjoyed to get it back. And so Samuel had led the people in a time of revival. They, you know, put away your foreign gods and, and, and you know, commit yourself to God and seek him with all your heart. That's what he told the people. And they had this wonderful time of revival. But now let me tell you something. Do you know that when the Lord begins to work in your life or in your heart, to draw you closer to him, you know what happens? The devil starts to work too. 
sometimes like tell people, look, if, if the devil's not bothering you, 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 you know, check. It means he, he figures he's already got you, you know, so a lot of times that's what he's got you if he's not bothering you. Uh, but so you would think, okay, I'm going here. It's victorious. God is with me. Life is going to be smooth from here on. There are a lot of preachers who preach that kind of thing, but that is not the Christian life. It's a struggle. It's a fight. And you know what? We are called to stand and fight, just like these Israelites we're going to read about. Look at verse 7, and we'll read down through verse 11, then come back and talk about them. It says, When the Philistines heard that the sons of Israel had gathered to Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the sons of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. Then the sons of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, and the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day against the Philistines and confused them, so that they were routed before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them down as far as below beth Car. Well, you know, if you will be dedicated to God, if you will dedicate your heart and your life to God, if you will seek God with all of your heart, you can expect to be in a fight. It's just as simple as that. The enemy is going to come after you. And he'll have all kinds of subtle ways to do it. Sometimes it might be, you know, we always think, oh, he's going to throw temptation right up there in front of my face. Well, whatever the thing that causes me to stumble, they, well, that, that might be part of it, okay? So that's part of the fight. But a lot of times it's even more subtle things. It's the, it's, it's the little, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the nicks and things. You know, you're strong and then it weakens you. You're strong and it weakens you. And he just keeps on and on and on. And at some point, you want to get away from all this, but we're called to stay in the fight. You ever watch a boxing match? You, ever watch, you don't see boxing much anymore. You used to, Friday night fights used to be on. You watch, I used to like to watch boxing. I don't know what that says about me. As long as I didn't have to get up there and get beat up, I like watching two other guys go at each other and beat themselves up. But you know, you, the, the one guy, you don't just walk in there as soon as the bell rings and throw a big old haymaker. I'm going to end this thing right now. And sometimes that happens. Most of the time it's a long, drawn out affair. I mean, a guy's just peck, peck, boom, a body blow, a jab, this, that, until you're just worn down, you know. And finally they move in for the kill, you know. And sometimes it just gets to where you're just like, I can't stand this anymore. I'm done. I want to go home. Those body blows begin to take their, take their toll. And you're like, I just can't fight anymore. I got to go. Well, listen, if you're going to be dedicated to God, you can expect a fight and you can expect a long-term fight. But here's the call. We need to stand and fight. Stand your ground and stay in the fight. And when you commit yourself to a relationship with God, here's a couple of things that I'm pretty certain we can count on. And one is that you can count on this as a fact. And most of us, I think, in here are going to agree with this. The enemy will come after you. If you're going to commit yourself to God, the enemy is coming after you. Look at verse 7. When the Philistines heard that the sons of Israel had gathered to Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the sons of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. All right. Well, like I said, background, if you look up here at the first part of this chapter, we talked about it last time we were together. In verse 1, we see where the ark has been returned to Israel. You remember the, the background of the whole story? Israel and the Philistines had gone to war. The Philistines had so completely defeated the Israelites that they had captured the ark of the covenant. Uh, the priesthood was wiped out. It was just a bad day for Israel. But then it became a bad day for Philistine, for Philistia. Because, you know, like I said, look, God does not dwell with unrighteousness. And the Philistines took that ark and put it in their temple beside their God as a war trophy. And I hope y'all went and read the whole story. Like I said last week, you know, it was five and six. And come back the next morning, and there's their God fell over on his face. They set him up, he falls over again. They nail him up, he falls over again. 
and this and all kinds of bad things start happening to them. They break out with boils and tumors. The rats start overrunning their country, and they think well, we got to get rid of this thing. And so they send it back to the Israelites. Israel is overjoyed to get it back. Here it comes. It's a happy day. Okay, and that's what we talked about last week. God, you know, offered this redemptive uh, opportunity for Israel. Yes, they had been rebellious. Yes, they had been sinful. Yes, God had, so to speak, turned his back on them for a time. But God, when he commits himself to his people, he does not abandon them completely. And so God returned, so to speak, to Israel. That ark represented his presence, and there it came back. And when it came back, Israel was overjoyed. And now Samuel steps in to his leadership role at this point. Like I said, Eli's gone. Uh, the priesthood's wiped out. Samuel had been recognized as a prophet by this point and as a leader himself, and he becomes the main leader and the judge of Israel. And he led, and you can read down through verse 6 if you want to, a time of rededication where he challenged the people, put the gods, foreign gods away, seek God with all your heart. And Israel had this great and wonderful revival. And he tells them, you know, he says, uh, gather all the people to Mizpah and I will pray to the Lord for you. That was in verse five. So they had this big convocation. I don't know. Could we call it a what, what they used to call it back in the old days? A protracted meeting. They had this big convocation, big revival meeting, gathered everybody up. And so the nation and when it says all of the nation, now you don't have to understand that you don't have to say that that is every single Israelite, you know, somebody's at home tending the sheep and, and you know, keeping the little kids and, and doing some things. But most of the people, a huge convocation of the people have gathered to this place as Samuel leads them in a time of revival. And what the Philistines saw when they saw this was they looked at this gathering of the Israelites and they saw a golden opportunity. Here these people have gathered together for a religious festival. They are gathered together. They are offering sacrifices. They are praising their God. They are all in one piece. They're nothing. We've been able to take them already. Guess what? Let's go get them again. You know, we'll get them while they're praising God. We'll get them while they're not expected. We'll get them while they feel good. And so Phil, uh, the Philistines come against them. Like I said, they were not afraid of the Israelites. They were heady with their recent success. They've been able to trounce these Israelites any time they've come against them. And so the Philistines go to war and come against the Israelites, even as they are seeking to get closer to their God. You know, the Philistines thought, no problem. We've got them. They're all in one place. They've been easy for us to handle to begin with. We're stronger. We're better armed. Let's take advantage of this and just end this Israelite problem once and for all. Well, it kind of works that way for us too. When you begin to focus on God and when you begin to seek God with all your heart and you begin to really commit yourself to God, your enemy comes after you. This is the golden opportunity. And your enemy is stronger than you. The Philistines were stronger than Israel. They proved it in battle. They routed them. They've trounced them already. They were a better army. They were tougher soldiers. They were better armed. Your enemy has defeated you many times in the past. Hadn't. Think about it. You haven't passed every test, have you? None of us have. We've all failed from time to time. We fail in what we do. We fail in what we think. We fail in what we say. We fail in what we don't do. We fail in what we don't say. The enemy comes after us. He's defeated us many times. We've not been a problem at all. We've been easy pickings, easy prey. And so as you try to get close to God, your enemy looks and sees, I'll get him. You know, I'll get him. I'll get him. The enemy will come hard to destroy your testimony. That's ultimately what it's all about. He wants to, see the enemy comes after you. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about me. See, this is the thing that's so hard to get through our minds sometimes. 
See, God loves you. God loves me. Individually, personally. He cares what happens to you and me. The devil doesn't care. Your enemy doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about you personally. You might think. He might, you know, be so subtle as you think he's really trying. But all he cares about is discrediting your heavenly father. And if he can use you as a tool for that, well, that's all he cares about. You know how, you know, he just wants to make God look bad. And so he will come to destroy your testimony. He'll send maybe different ways he comes against you. Maybe challenges at work. You know, things start to happen at your work. Things build up and people begin to come against you. And the next thing you know, you're like, well, what is going on with this? And how am I going to answer this? Are you going to answer it the way the world would answer it? Or are you going to stick to your testimony for Christ no matter what happens? You know, relationships all of a sudden start to go sour. How are you going to handle? Are we going to handle it looking to God or are we going to handle it like the world handles it? Uh, memories of sin. Man, this is, this is a good one, y'all. This is one of the enemy's best tactics when he comes at you. He, he reminds you of all the things you've done bad and how many times you failed before. All the mean things you've said, all the hateful things you've done, all the unrighteous things you've thought or acted on, whatever it was. He brings that up and then says, you really think that God loves you. Look what's in your background. You know, that's an effective tactic. You come against you hard with that. People will stand around looking for you to stumble. You ever have people, look, listen, maybe you had this at work. If you worked in the workplace and you tried to maintain a Christian testimony, people will try to push your buttons and pull your string and get your goat just to just so that when you let that word slip they go ah laugh you know what i made him say you know what i made her do you know it's funny that's what the enemy does if you want to grow closer to god he's going to come after you. he's going to come after you in a lot of ways and he's very slick and he's very strong and he's very uh, patient in first peter chapter one peter would write to his people, he says, Therefore, gird your mind for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. You shall be separated. You shall be consecrated, so to speak, because that's what I am. And Peter was writing that to a group of people who were facing some really, really tough opposition from, a, from an enemy that was coming at them hard and heavy. And he says, you know what? Gird your mind. Be ready. Keep a clear head. He says, keep sober. You don't have to say, okay, well, I'm not drunk. You know, he means be serious. Because the enemy's going to come. You got to be ready. When you commit to your relationship with God, the enemy will come after you. And because he's coming after you, when you commit to God and the enemy comes, we've got to realize that we need help. If the enemy's coming after me, I need help. We had a great example of this in world events in the last, you know, couple of years. Here, the Russians went and attacked Ukraine. And everybody thought that would be over with in no time. The Ukrainians are still in there. Do you know the, the president there in Ukraine, he was not ashamed to go on to, in the worldwide media and say, we need help. These people are going to overrun our country. We need guns and, 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 and equipment. And, you know, we can't stand up to them. Almost in a way like uh, when Churchill at the early part of the Second World War when all of Europe had been overrun and only Britain was left standing and he was appealing to the United States if when we were trying to stay neutral he said we need help over here he said if you won't come and join the fight he had that great he says at least send us equipment you know we can't build this stuff ourselves to fight off the Germans give us the tools and we will finish the job was his famous quote we need help we need help and you and I need help when the enemy comes. Israel went to war with the Philistines. Again. 
you know, this is a current thing in the, in the Old Testament. How many times you look up and Israel's fighting the Philistines? Here they are fighting the Philistines. King Saul's going to come along later. Guess what he's going to spend most of his kingdom doing? Two things, chasing after David and fighting Philistines. I mean, that's the, eventually the Philistines are going to kill him. David's going to become king. Guess what he spends most of his time doing? Fighting Philistines. I mean, this is a constant thing. They're always at war with each other. But here they had gone to war. The Philistines were coming again. They have just lost uh, a, a terrible conflict with the Philistines. The, uh, God had given them over, and they're fixing to have to go in again, and they realize that they can't stand up. You know, they just, I mean, it, it went badly for them the last time. And so they asked Samuel to intercede for them. I love that in verse 8 and 9 where it says, The sons of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the land of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. They knew they needed help. So they looked out there and the Philistines came against them. Philistia was a stronger better armed country uh, it, they were wealthier than Israel especially at this time they were more unified than Israel at this time we think of Israel as a as a you know a nation because we have this idea of modern Israel one nation and they're unified wasn't the case at this time this is the period of the judges each tribe is its own individual nation so to speak the Israel is not really a nation. It's a loose confederacy of tribes. Judah, Dan, Asher, Ephraim, all these tribes thrown together. And if you read through the book of the Judges, you see that they don't always work in concert with each other. You know, sometimes they, they've got jealousies. These don't go to fight when these others do. Maybe four or five go to fight. You know, some of the others don't. So the Philistines were a much more better organized much stronger uh, people, much better equipped, much better armed. It's interesting when you read the, the histories of the, of the uh, back and forth between Israel and the Philistines. The Philistines lived down along the coastline. The Israelites lived up in the mountains, okay, around Jerusalem, up there in the, in the hills. And there's these sort of foothills in between the two, which is kind of like the country we have right here in our little part of the country here in Bradley County. Nice rolling hills, fertile uh, farmlands called the Shephelah. And that's what they would fight back and forth over. The Philistines and the Israelites both wanted it for the same reason. It was good farmland, you know. And so when Israel was strong, they control it. When Philistine was strong, they would control it. And so uh, here they are at this point. The Philistines are in control with all of it. But when the Philistines were up, and they would be many times, they would try to keep the Israelites down. They would make the Israelites serve them. One of the things that they did to the, the Israelites by saying how the Philistines were better armed, they would not allow any blacksmiths in Israel. There were no Israeli blacksmiths. You know why? So they couldn't make weapons. That's a whole nother thought. You know, we don't want to get down a political uh, uh, <laughs> wormhole with that one. But we'll disarm them. They can't make axes and hatchets and swords if they don't have smiths. And so they didn't allow them to have blacksmiths. If you were an Israelite farmer and you were plowing and you needed a, 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 a plowshare, your plow, you had to take it to a Philistine town and get a Philistine blacksmith to fix your plow or to fix your pruning hooks or to fix any kind of implement like that you used on your farm so that Israel couldn't turn them into weapons so here Philist the philistines are better armed better organized ready to go to war israel realized this and at this point said we need help and they got samuel and they said pray for us pray for us cry out and i love what they said look look how they said it in verse eight do not cease don't stop praying for us. We're going to war. We're going to battle. Samuel, your job is not to get a sword and come out there with us. You get up on that hilltop over there and you pray till this thing is over with because our hope is God. And that's the only hope that we have if we're going to have to go to war with these people. Israel had trusted itself and failed before. 
chapter four. We've already talked about that. That's when they lost the ark before. They trusted their own strength and their own wisdom and they were defeated. Joshua chapter seven, go all the way back there and read how Israel had crossed the Jordan River and they had gotten over there and they had taken the town of Jericho and the walls had fallen. And then they looked at the next little town down the road and said, oh, that'll be easy. We'll take them. We don't even need to send the whole army. And they went up there and just got whipped because they trusted their own strength and their own wisdom. And they had to get back on their knees and get before God and say, where did we go wrong? God had to show them some unrighteousness that was among them. And they had to turn from that and say, here, here. Go with us, God, because we need help. See, the life that you and I are called to live in Christ is not a life that we can live in our own power. We must have divine help or we are bound to fall. You can't just walk an aisle, say, I want to give my heart to Jesus, get me wet in the baptistry, and I'll go out there and do it you will fail without God with you every moment of the day. If you're not seeking the Lord, if you don't realize you need help. And you know, I think most of us, we're pretty good at knowing that we need help in the big things. I've just gotten a terrible health diagnosis. I better go to God. Man, there's things going on at work. They're going to close the factory. They're going to my work. But I don't know. I, I need to keep, I got, I got to go to God. I've got to take this to God. My marriage is falling apart. I need to take this to God. We're good about recognizing I need help in the big things, but I'm going to tell you, I need help in the little things too. I need help driving across town. You know, <laughs> I need help driving across town. He talk about these road rage incidences. Those things are just, that's just all too close to home there, y'all. I'll, I'll just be honest. We're going to fail. We're going to fall if we trust in our own strength. The life we are called to live, we must have divine help to live it. We read in 1 Peter chapter 1 there a minute ago. I'm going to turn over a couple more pages and read over in 1 Peter chapter 5. Like I said, He's writing to people who are fighting this battle a long time ago. Verse 6, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He might exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon Him because He cares for you. Be of sober spirit and be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him. Now listen to this next phrase. He doesn't say, stand strong. You know, be tough. He says, resist him firm in your faith, standing in God. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Peter says, the enemy's coming after you. He's coming after you hard. It's going to be tough. Stand firm in your faith, and God will bring you the victory. You're not going to win it yourself. You're not going to win it yourself. You need help. We need God. I need I need God every single day. So when you commit to your relationship with God, the enemy's coming after you, and he's coming hard. We have to recognize then that we need help. And that help's got to come from God. And here's the thing about it. Now, we just talked about stand and fight. When you commit to God, it's going to be a fight. And you're going to need help in that fight. Call on God for help and stay in the fight until God shows up. That's the tough part sometimes. Look at verse, look at verse 10. It says, Samuel was offering up the burnt offering and the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day against the Philistines and confused them, so they were routed before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mitpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them down as far as below Beth Car. There we go. We got them back, right? Yeah, they beat us and got the ark, and we whipped them back. You know, now the now the Israelites are up. And uh, I, I love that it. it says there, it's talking about uh, the Lord thundered with a great thunder. 
Y'all want to take a gander as to what Baal was known as? He was the god of thunder, rain, thunderstorms. Now, this isn't saying that, you know, God was... That it actually says God thundered with a great sound. I don't know what it was. I would like to know what happened there, okay? It just There was a huge noise out of nowhere, out of a clear blue sky that all of a sudden just threw, you know, the, it just shook the Philistines up so much. They, they, you know, they lost their formation. They lost their discipline. The Israelites were able to take advantage of them of that time and they charged in and seized the moment. I don't know if God commanded all the angels in heaven to all of a sudden blow their trumpets and made that great sound. I don't know. You know, that's one of the things we'll have to ask when we get to heaven. But it might, it would have been something to seen and heard. Threw the Philistines into confusion. The Israelites were like, let's go. That's God showing up. He's here. There's our help. A well-trained, well-equipped Philistine army stood before Israel. And Israel stood before them in their sort of loosely organized, almost militia-type army that they had. And they held their line. Samuel prayed and ministered. And then all of a sudden, God divinely interceded and enabled Israel to rout those Philistines. Took them, I mean, Israel had to stand there and look at those tough Philistines getting closer and closer. What did it look like as the Philistines were marching, you know? And the Israelites standing there. Looking back here, Samuel's still praying. Okay, you know? Samuel's still there? Yeah, he's still there. Okay, we're going to stand, you know? Did Samuel leave yet? No, he's still there. Okay. And then God showed up. They had an opportunity to turn and run, y'all. A lot of people would at the start of the battle. And if they had been in their own strength, they would have too. But they held in there and they held the line until God brought in perfect timing exactly what needed to be brought. Now, here's what I like about this. We could have read there that it says that Israel stood there, lined up, Samuel prayed, and then God just sent a lightning bolt and struck all the Philistines dead and left them laying there. The Israelites didn't even break a sweat. But that's not what happened. See, sometimes God wants you to be active. He wants you to learn you can trust Him in the fight. Don't run from the fight. Stay in the fight because you can trust Him in the fight. And, the, and, and all God did was make some humongous big noise that so disturbed and confused and, and disoriented the Philistines that it gave the Israelites the opportunity they needed. And they didn't waste the opportunity. They jumped on it. I'm reminded of, uh, you know, they were active. But God was the difference. Yes, Israel had, Israel had to go in. They had to fight. They had to be there. They had to go up, but it was God that was the difference. I, I'm reminded of you know, one of my favorite quotes of all time. In, in, in this guy's a controversial historical figure. He'll read the, about the English Civil War back in the 1600s. And the main, most successful commander of the English rebels, who would later uh, become sort of the dictator of England himself after they had executed the king, Oliver Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell had a famous quote. Oliver Cromwell was a Puritan. He was a very devout man, and he was a leader of these Puritan forces. And he, this very devout Puritan man who was uh, regular in prayer himself would encourage his soldiers by saying, we're going into battle, trust God, and keep your powder dry. I love that quote. <laughs> trust God and keep your powder dry. Because we're not going to stand by. God wants us to be active. You know, Cromwell wasn't saying that. It's like, just in case God doesn't work, you know, we need to help God out. No, he said, we've got a part in this fight. We trust God to see us through the fight, so we're going to stand in here and fight. And sometimes I think this is where we fall down. We say, I'm going to pray to God, and I want God to do it all for me. Well, God wants us to be in there, getting knocked around a little bit. It's okay if we get bloodied a little bit. It's okay if we take the and arrows of this world because that's going to bring him glory if he if he if we are loyal to him during it we trust god 
and we are active. Trust God and get in there. Stay in the fight and do what he's called us to do. Jesus told his disciples this very thing. On that last supper, you read it in the book of John. You know, he, he's sitting there and he's passed the cup. They've had the bread. Uh, they're all sitting there enjoying this Passover Seder. This is heights of the disciples' mind of the ministry. Everything going along swimmingly. Jesus is about to be the Messiah on the throne. They didn't know he was about to be arrested in just a few short hours and going to be hanging on a cross, okay? But he told them while they were eating. You know what he told them? He didn't tell them. It's all going to be hunky-dory for you guys. You guys are going to change the world. You guys are going to uh, do that. No, he said, in this world, you will have trouble. This world hated me. It's going to hate you too. It's going to be tough. You're going to have problems. But, he said, take heart. I have overcome the world. The world's going to give you trouble but I've overcome the world. You get out there and carry my gospel and my name. Go kill me. I'll take care of the rest. And that's our goal. There's a war coming for our hearts, our souls, our families, our community. Our job, our calling is to hold the light of Christ in this ever-darkening world. The enemy's going to come against us. He's going to come hard. We're going to have to have help to stand firm, but we need to stand. And we keep standing, God will show up. Nothing that he plans will ever fall short. So be faithful. The life we're called to is spiritual warfare. And it's not for the weak. That's one of the knocks against Christianity, you know. Tough guys don't like to be Christian. That's what girly men, you know, they'll say. They're like, you, they don't understand what this Christian life's all about. You can't be weak and live it. You got to be strong, but you got to be strong in the Lord. You got to be strong in the Lord. That's the difference. Yes, we'll be active, but it's God that makes a difference. And so we're going to look to him. So stand and fight. We'll stop there here tonight. <laughs> and uh, we'll close up here with a word of prayer. And as we go off from this part of our Bible study, I want to remind the folks watching us online that we're going to be back together. Nine o'clock, Sunday school, okay? Ten o'clock for our regular service. Hope you could join us in person. If you can't, we do understand. Join us on whatever media outlet you easiest for you to access us on that you're watching us on right now at those times. Uh, if you have a prayer concern or a comment or some feedback, we would love to hear it. Just message us through whatever you're watching us on or through our website at Church or call the church office at 423-479-1713. Uh, hope men breakfast Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. If you're watching this online, you are welcome to. Come on over. And you don't have to be a certain age, okay? We take men from, uh, if they have to be carried in in a stroller, those men, because they're going to be men one day, you know, all the way up to if, <laughs> I say it this way, if they have to be carried in in a stroller or pushed in in a stroller, we'll take them. They, they, they're all welcome, okay, from whatever age. All right, let's close the word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come before you again. Father, we just love you so much, and we know, Father, you've called us, Lord, to a difficult fight. But, Father, we know you've not called us to win it. Uh, Father, that's for you. Help us just to be faithful, to stand firm, stand our ground, and to see you at work. I pray for each person here and watching this, Father, that they will see you at work in their life, Father, in the days ahead. And we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you and good night.